Thanks for joining. My name is Tama Nakahara. I'm the head of the developer experience at Weaveworks. Uh, and hopefully you joined us uh, through like our meetup pages, um, our Weave online user group, our GitOps community groups. Uh, today, we're really excited to present to you um, the easiest way to GitOps, which is a new offering through what we call Weave GitOps. It's free and open source. And we'll be walking you through um, what's called Weave GitOps Core. So um, we're really excited to have Cornelia Davis, our CTO, and Paul Fremantle, our VP of Engineering, uh, joining us for this. So thank you so much for joining. And uh, we are here to get your feedback on something we just launched a week ago at GitOps Days, because um, we want to quickly improve and get this to be what we think is the easiest way to GitOps. So thanks for joining. Uh, so a little background, if you're brand new and you said, I've never heard of this company, WeWorks, um, hopefully you can check us out at we.works. Um, a core part of us is that uh, we are definitely founded on open source. You may know um, our CNCF projects, such as uh, Flux and Flagger, which is under one, it's a Flux CD org. Um, and then we have Cortex, which is also in CNCF, as well as many, many other open source projects to which um, we've either created or we contribute to, um, we contribute to upstream Kubernetes. Um, we've been deeply founded in this history. And now we're really excited to talk about Weave GitOps, which is also um, free and open source. We have this Weave GitOps core that we will be going through today. Um, and it also is leading to a product. Um, and currently we also have the product uh, WKP, as well as uh, you might know Weave Cloud, which is our SaaS offering that has a lot of these things like Flux and Cortex. Uh, as a service. So that's our background. If you haven't heard of us, then thanks for joining us for the first time and joining our Weave online user group. And our website is weave.works. So a little bit of housekeeping. So as I mentioned, we're really excited to have Cornelia Davis, our CTO, as well as Paul Fremantle, our VP of engineering. Um, most of these sessions last about um, 45 minutes. Today, I think we'll be taking up the full hour. Um, if you've come to our past Weave Online user group uh, sessions, we usually target about 45 minutes. And uh, if we go over time, it's a hard, hard stop at 60. Um, today, we have a jam-packed uh, schedule. So I believe we will be taking up a full 60 minutes. Um, and hopefully by now, everybody is used to Zoom. Um, but this is a slide we've kept on just in case people need some basics. Um, the best way to ask questions is to ask in the chat. Um, and yeah, make sure that you choose to talk to everyone or all panelists or attendees uh, so that uh, a lot of times people help each other with their questions so you can uh, talk to each other as well. So please make sure to do that. Otherwise, the questions only come to us, the panelists, unless you have something burningly private you only want to share with us. But uh, please make sure the chat function works for you in Zoom. So last week's we last week on Tuesday and Wednesday we had GitOps Days. It was such a fantastic event where we had so many speakers um, for different companies and technologies represented, um, and we launched uh, Weave GitOps. Um, if you weren't able to see it, no problem. You can still go register at the website where you'll um, get an email with all the early links and um, access to assets and resources. So even if you missed it, no problem. Make sure that you go to that site, fill in your email. If you don't see the email, make sure you check your spam folder. I know that happened to some people, um, but you should be able to get an email that has all the links so you can get caught up with GitOps Days 2021. So with that, again, thanks for coming. So today, what we're going to do is we have Cornelia, who's going to give a Weave GitOps overview. Um, if you saw Cornelia on Tuesday, she kind of gave a longer overview talk. Um, today, she'll kind of give a more concentrated version to really like hammer home like the why, the why that why that we build Weave GitOps, why we are making the easiest way to GitOps, and how we're really excited by the design of it. Um, and then from there make sure you got your laptops ready because we're actually going to go through the getting started steps. Paul Fremantle will guide us through and it'll be a real hands-on. We want people to get stuck. We want people to have problems so that we can capture all that and we really want to improve our docs and guides. So we appreciate your um, participating. So please be prepared to join us for that. So um, we'll share these steps with you following um, it, during the hands-on. So just letting you know, um, we'll put these links in the chat to get you started. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Cornelia. 
Awesome. Thank you, Tamo. So um, I do want to just set the stage a little bit. I won't take a ton of time because I think it's more important that you get your hands on. Um, and uh, Paul's going to lead us through that. But I do want to share a couple of slides. I didn't create separate slides for today. I'm using the same ones that I used last week when we announced we'd get ops. Um, uh, but I think that the, this story, of course, is still quite relevant. So let me share, and I will assume that you will let me know if you do not see my slides, but you should be seeing them now. Yes, you can see them. Awesome. Okay. So um, Tomo already suggested, already already kind of gave the, uh, the, the TLDR, which is this is all about the easiest way to get ops. Now, why do you want to get ops? Sure, you want to get ops because it's the coolest thing everybody's doing it, right? But really, you want to get ops because there's some kind of value that comes from it. There's some kind of business value, customer value. Um, and so the one of the, the first things that I'll point out is that GitOps is not something that just applies to one category of things that we need to operate in our IT landscape. It doesn't just apply to infrastructure or doesn't just apply to managing platforms or doesn't just apply to managing workloads that are customer facing. It ultimately applies to all of those things. However, what we are aiming for with this initial release of Weave GitOps is we are aiming to enable you, the developer of customer facing applications. We are not in, you'll see when we get started with some of these use cases and we get started with the, you know, the hands on um, in just a few minutes that we are not worrying about um, GitOpsing our Kubernetes clusters. We're not worrying about Git GitOpsing our IAM rules or policies, we are focusing on workloads that we're going to deploy on Kubernetes. And so what's the business value there? Well, the business value is to use GitOps, GitOps to optimize your SDLC, your software lifecycle. Because we found, of course, as an industry that if you get better at doing software, and I mean that very literally like that, very casually, like doing software, the better you are at doing software, the better the business outcomes. So if you can release more frequently, if you can shorten the time from an idea to getting it out into the hands of customers, if you can keep your system running more resiliently, if you can recover from failures more quickly, all of those things are gonna be better for your customers, better for your bottom line. And Weave GitOps is focused on helping you build up the right automation for that software lifecycle. And I'll emphasize that more again in just a moment. Now, the other point that I wanna emphasize here is that um, those of you who know me know that I spent you know, a good portion of the last decade working on developer platforms. I worked on Cloud Foundry and then eventually transitioned over to more Kubernetes-based platforms. Um, but back in the Kubernetes days, which would, I'm sorry, in the Cloud Foundry days, where which was a system that was optimized to that, that was built to optimize your software lifecycle, what we did to a large extent was we delivered to you the platform that we thought would be useful for you. And it was difficult to create behaviors other than those. We're doing things a bit differently here in that with Weave GitOps, we are delivering to you an opinionated set, an opinionated set of automation that we believe will help your software lifecycle. However, those conventions are not your only option. We favor convention over configuration, but it's not that we we have convention in lieu of configuration. So there's a second element here, and and Weave GitOps re really represents kind of a turning point in GitOps as a whole which is that we are delivering to you the foundation of a GitOps platform. So we'll deliver to you what your GitOps automation, what the baseline GitOps automation is, but we also deliver to you a platform that allows you to customize your GitOps automation. Um, I think we really are, we believe we're hitting about the 80-20 rule. So 80% of the time, the steps you're gonna go through today are going to be sufficient. And even in, I would say in 100% of the cases, it'll help you. But then in 20% of the cases, some 
cus customizations can help you even more, kind of turn it up to 11, if you will. And what we mean by that, that platform, that GitOps platform, is that we're allowing you to program your GitOps automations in the same way that you've been programming your CI automations in the past. We're not replacing CI. We are picking up where CI leaves off and we're helping you program the rest of the SDLC post CI. And of course, it's open source. So it's, it is a GitOps platform. I already emphasized that this is about today. We've GitOps core is really focused on enabling you, the developer. Um, but when it comes to some of these platform elements, uh, that's where the platform uh, engineer comes in. Now, everything that we're going to step you through today is stuff that you can do as a developer. You don't need to go to your platform team. You can download the open source, you can start using it, and you are good to go. Ultimately, once you're successful with these patterns, then your platform engineer later on, when you start to embrace this and adopt this more broadly across your organization, that's where the platform teams will help you do this in kind of a repeatable way. So what is that developer um, life cycle? So I'm gonna take a very concrete example here. It's very simple, um, but I think it's very real. I think most of you will resonate with this. So in order to deliver our software faster, shorten the time to market, keep things more resilient, this is the basic software life cycle. I'm writing code, I'm going through a cycle in unit testing. At some point, my unit tests turn green. That's when CI will kick in and build a container image. That container image will get deployed into a development environment where we'll do some integration um, testing. So dev or staging, something like that. And then we'll move that same artifact for a deployment out into the production environment. So we have separate environments. Now, the way that GitOps plays into this is this is the same picture. It just adds the GitOps element. You can see that this first part here is, again, writing code and checking it into a Git repository. That's the source code. And then there's CI that's building the image. Then where, where GitOps picks up is it says, all right, well, let me handle the rest of the software lifecycle. That was just step one. The rest of the software lifecycle, it says, all right, well, I'm going to store my configuration for these various environments in Git. And um, in, in this depiction, there's two different Git repositories. Those could be two different branches. If you saw the demo last week, I just used two different branches. Um, and then there's these steps that do things like deploy into that de development environment, or maybe even auto deploy into that development environment. And then there's the, okay, I'm going to issue a pull request, and then I'm going to approve that. And then again, I'm going to have some deployment automation here. That deployment automation is, of course, going to tie in with the rest of the automation that takes it all the way out to a runtime environment. And I'll show you one last screenshot on that in, in a moment. The important thing that I want to emphasize here, and I'm going to emphasize it even strongly and maybe in a better way than I did last week, which is what we're going to, what we're doing with Weave GitOps is we are enabling you to build up this flow. We are allowing you through a couple of WeGo commands to build up this flow. Those WeGo commands that we're going to help you with in just a moment, you only have to run those once to set up this flow. And then after that, the developer and the DevOps engineer that's running things in production continues to just operate here. Number one, they're doing Git pushes into their source code repository. Number two, they're creating PRs. Number three, they're reviewing and approving PRs and all the rest of it happens for you. So WeGo is about setting up that SDLC automation to optimize your delivery. And um, that's almost all I wanna say. The only last thing that I wanna do is I wanna show you this screenshot here, which is, um, I showed this last week. It is showing you kind of under development um, our user interface for Weave GitOps. What I want to point out here is that you can see that what we have here is we have two boxes on the left, the pod info application repository, that's actually configuration repository, and something, a step called a customization. These are 
portions of the GitOps automation that are focused on delivery, this delivers things to Kubernetes. And then the Kubernetes um, uh, automation will take care of orchestrating those containers. I wanted to point that out because GitOps, again, just to remind you, is not just about continuous delivery. It's about linking together continuous delivery together with continuous operations. And that gives us the holistic picture. And so when something changes, I can watch the automation propagate all the way from the change in a Git repository all the way out to instances being running in production. So if I quickly just show you the play on this, you can see that what we're doing is something's changed in Git and it resulted in things changing out in the runtime environment. So that entire flow is what we're looking to enable with you. Okay, so I'm happy to answer if there's any questions. I'll go ahead and stop my share, but I think that you all came here to see Paul and see Paul help you actually get your hands on this and get started. But if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer one or two. Cool. Um, I don't know if I noticed anything particular in the Slack. Um, I will call out, I know that um, um, people have joined our Weave GitOps Slack and just wanna say, uh, totally understand if some people have asked like, okay, so you guys have Flux, now we've GitOps, they're both, both open source. Um, you know, this is fairly new, but like I've been answering questions like, I think with every iteration of we've GitOps, I think you'll be able to see like, as we're, you know, we're trying to offer both to um, a wider range of users um, that will, and we'll definitely continue. The second question was like, wait, you know, I love Flux, like what's going on with Flux? And absolutely, we, we're so excited that, you know, we, we believe in Flux and um, we know it's like the most powerful tool. So we really want to build something on it. So really both we've um, GitOps core and Flux depend on each other's success. And as a company and as a community, we are absolutely dedicated to the success of both. So. Very, very excited there. So if you have any others, um, definitely follow us up on, on the Slack channel. I put it in the chat. Um, I'll put it in again for anybody who joined new. Um, but with that, I'll hand it over to Paul and post again here that please take out your laptops and join with us to follow along with these um, getting started steps. Like I said, we just launched this. So we absolutely want people to uh, try it fall over, raise their hands. Like we really um, want to make sure that you are able to go through these steps. So with that, uh, I'll leave it to Paul and, and I'll monitor here to make sure people aren't feeling shy. Cause if you just watch along and um, don't do it, then uh, uh, you won't be able to see the benefit. Oh, oh and the final thing I should mention is um, if you are running Flux in a cluster, you don't want to install Weave GitOps there. You definitely want to make sure these are two separate things. I've heard it's not, uh, uh, you know, they're not two things that should be in the same cluster. So. Thanks, Tamo. Thanks, Cornelia. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Tamo's chosen me because I am sort of like, like the beta tester. I am not like the world's best techie. I am just a basic user. And so I'm a great person to show you how this works. And if I make mistakes, you'll probably spot them quicker than me. Um, so I'm literally just going to go through the the getting started guide uh, from from top to bottom. It doesn't do everything that Cornelia's demo did, but hopefully it will get you running. Um, so uh, the first thing we're going to do is go to the introduction. It says see installation getting started has a little bit about with GitOps and this, these docs are super early. They are being fixed and improved as we speak, but hopefully this will work for you. Now, um, so I'm literally just gonna copy this set of commands from here and then paste it into my, oh, I hate Zoom, it's always getting in the way, and paste it into my thing. Now, I am slightly aware that if you are like on a Linux ARM machine, this may not quite work. And if you have any problems, let me know and we can uh, help you with the download. It's not, not very difficult. So you can see this is just nearly there, 100%, and it's doing a sudo, so it needs my password. And there it has installed, and it's version 0.005 of 
with GitOps core and it's uh, using Flux version uh, 0 0.13.2 and okay. it has some Ooh. other information. Hey, Tamara, go Shall ahead. Shall we take a pause? I just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, first of all, make sure everybody is at this page. And checking to see the messages. Also, um, you know, we jumped right into it. Any major prerequisites that could right. hamper? So we're about to have a look at the prereqs. Um, I just thought we'd get that installed. The There True. are a bunch of prereqs. So you do need GitHub at the moment. We don't yet support GitLab. We're adding that right as we speak. Uh, you need a GitHub token, which I can show you how to create. Uh, you need kubectl, and I'm using kind, so you, I, I suggest you, if you kind would be the best um, thing to try it out on first, the best uh, Kubernetes cluster, but it does work on other Kubernetes clusters. As Tamo says, as long as you know we're not trying to uh, co-install this with Flux, and if you're using kind, then you need Docker. Um, and just letting people know, uh, I know there are a couple of questions, uh, broader questions uh, from earlier, and we've got a couple of people working on your answers. So just letting you know about that. Um, and then for some of the people who've joined new, um, yes, give us a sign. Are you uh, following along? This is working out. Have you, who, for example, has not been able to get the first installation uh, completed? Okay, and I will get the Slack link because people are asking. So. Okay, I think we're good to proceed. Okay, so you do need a GitHub token with repo access, and I will just show you. Um, I, I think a lot of people who are into this kind of thing will probably have a GitHub token with repo access, but if you go to GitHub, and you need to go to uh, settings. And then you go down to developer settings. And then you go to personal access tokens. And you can see I've already created one called Rego with repo access. But uh, assuming you haven't got one, you would go generate new token. You'd give it a, a, a name like Rego and you just click on repo. And generate token and then I'm not going to do this because obviously I don't want to display my token to the to the <laughs> everyone on the webinar it's not that I don't trust you but this is being recorded so it wouldn't be a great idea um, but so you would generate that token and then if you have a look at the thing it says you need that token in your environment as github token and I've uh, put it in my bash profile so it's already there again I'm not going to show you but I promise you it's there um, so we've installed the CLI and I'm assuming you've installed uh, kind so the next step is to go kind create cluster and that will just take a minute to go and launch a cluster so that will give people time to catch up and ask any questions if they have any. Since I can't see the questions, I'm relying on Tamo to. Yes, I am monitoring. Here. So far, I think it's pretty good. Uh, Fred asks, where does Kind create a cluster? Good question. So Kind creates the cluster in Docker. So if I uh, just start a new uh, window and I go docker ps you can see what it's actually doing is here is creating the cluster as a as a docker image it's it's pretty clever so kind stands for kubernetes in docker and it just creates it in your local docker as a as a single container it's pretty mad it's sort of like docker in docker it's a single container that then runs the whole of Kubernetes inside it. It's, it's very clever. Um, so now you can see I can go kubectl uh, 
cluster info and you can see it's just my local uh, kind instance and if I do kubectl get all it's just just the Kubernetes service running. So uh, we did that we go version so we go should be in the command line see we go version so now there is just one really simple command that installs we go onto the cluster and you type we go install and it just starts um, installing it and basically what the verifying installation is doing is waiting for all the controllers to start up so it's going to start a set of controllers um, and this is just waiting so I'm going to uh, start up a new window and just do a kubectl uh, get pods and minus namespace we go system which will show you and you can see they're just creating so it's it's um and it's basically as as we said it's running the uh, core set of controllers from flux so this is installing flux into your system and configuring it all Okay. So and a follow-up question. So, yeah. sort of following up to what you had mentioned earlier, to Fred's question, so you want to know. So, we do need a Docker machine up and working. That's a requirement. We do need Docker as a prerequisite for, for kind. If okay. you have a Kubernetes cluster somewhere else, like in GKE or DigitalOcean, and you have kubectl locally, you can do this. Great. Um, so that's the install finished. So let me just, before you ask the next question, you can see all the controllers are running and the installer has spotted that and uh, just check them all and said install finished. Sorry, okay. go ahead, Tara. Um, yeah, uh, Vio is asking, are kind and K3S almost the same in terms of a single node cluster? So they are similar, yeah. So K3S is a really, really cool project which is like a really cut down version of uh, Kubernetes. And uh, I haven't actually tested this on K3S, but I'm pretty confident it'll work. Okay. You wanna try that. Another area for us to test out. So yeah, another area for us to test out. So here we are, it says exactly what I've just done. You can kubectl get pods in the Wego system namespace and you'll see they're all running. So what we're going to do is, uh, those of you who've tried Flux or, or those of you who haven't may have come across this uh, pod info Kubernetes app, uh, which um, Stefan Prodan has written. And uh, we have a simple uh, repository, which if we go look at it, is literally just the deployment manifests for pod info. So the pod info repository is kind of uh, how can I put it it's got helm charts it's got different deployment ints so it's a little complex this is literally just the the namespace yaml the back end deployment pod auto scaler and service yaml and the front end uh, deployment and service yaml so uh, there is a way of setting up Weave GitOps core to just deploy from this uh, upstream repo, but it's kind of more fun to fork it. So I'm going to fork it. Uh, and so now I have a fork of that. And so, and then it says, you know, clone the fork using SSH. So what I'm going to do is go code. SSH and I'm going to copy that and I'm going to go to uh, and I'm going to choose a directory and I'm going to git clone and paste that SSH target and we're going to have a clone of it. So that was quite easy and so obviously now I want to switch into that directory 
and the CD into there. And you can see it's exactly what I just showed you. Uh, just some simple YAMLs for deployment into Kubernetes. So we have a question. Yeah. Um, are these controllers available now? Yes. They are. Actually, Tomo, that was a question that was in the thread in the oh. IAC thread. Oh, so. I apologize. Sorry. No problem. So, so, uh, you know, Cornelia said something really interesting. She said, this is like a super easy way of getting all this running. And so far, we've done some Git stuff. We've done some GitHub stuff. But fundamentally, we've only typed one with GitOps command so far, and that was with GitOps install. This time, I'm now, I've switched into that directory, and I'm going to add that application to my with GitOps uh, cluster and config. And this is going to go in, and it prints out a lot of stuff. I think we're probably going to tidy this up so it's a little neater. And basically, that says pushing app manifesto repository. And there you see it all. And so fundamentally, that is it. I now have uh, a, if I go copy this, and I go see what's happening in my namespace test. Nothing's happening yet, but I'm going to wait. This has basically set up GitOps. So this is kind of like a kubectl applied those manifests into my cluster, except on steroids, because not only have I kubectl applied them once, but they are now going to be continuously reconciled. And this is a simple example, but if I had Helm charts, if I had customize, if I had secrets, it's going to handle all of that for you. So, and there we go, 20 seconds in, it's now actually running those uh, clusters. And so there is a command we can see to see what is going on there. And what that did was to give this app a name based on that, uh, based on that repository fork that I did. And so what you can see here let me just enlarge this for a second so you can really see it. It says last successful deployment time was at 1734 GMT, which is 1834 here, where I am in the UK. And you can see that it has uh, taken the podinfo deploy and fetched a particular revision of it, and it's ready. And there are two basic uh, items here. The first one is saying that it's got the source correctly. That's something called the source controller. And then the second one is the customization, which is saying it's actually applied that uh, YAML into the cluster. So, so this is really nice. And uh, I have it running. So before I go on, let me just show you, uh, because Cornelia said something really interesting about the GitOps automation. And what that has done is it's actually, it's done a couple of things. So the first thing is it's used that GitHub token to, um, to create a deploy key. So it's created an SSH key read-only SSH key, which is now going to be uh, applied as a secret into the cluster. So this is a, a technique of minimizing the blast radius. So in other words, this, this uh, GitOps automation needs to be able to read your Git repository fork in order to do that. And the way it does that is with a deploy key from GitHub. And we've created the minimal key that's needed and saved it as a secret in the cluster so that the uh, Get, GitOps runtime can pull updates. The second thing it's done is if I do a LSAL, it's actually created this uh, directory called .wego. And if I tree in here, you can see there are two different YAMLs in here. There's a 
app YAML and a target YAML. And uh, these two YAMLs basically are what Cornelia was talking about when she, she says we're defining a GitOps automation configuration that is going to configure the GitOps automation that happens for this project into this cluster. And uh, I will take a quick look at them. Uh, but before I do that, uh, one of the things that also Cornelia talked about is really nice is this uh, idea that it is highly flexible, but it's opinionated. So the default behavior of with GitOps is to put this into your application uh, deployment uh, repository. So this is the repository I have that has my uh, deployment YAMLs in it, and this is a great place to put this configuration. However, you may well have lots of applications and you want and lots of clusters and you want to have a specific repository to do that. You can do that. Uh, if I do, we go app add minus minus help. You can see this thing called the app config URL. This basically tells uh, we go where to put those manifests. So you can configure this any way you like, and you can also see you can have particular branches that you replicate, there you can have charts you replicate, you can do customize a helm, um, and you can choose particular owners and paths within it. You can specify the private key if you don't want it to automatically create a deploy key. So there's loads of cool stuff going on in here if you want to, but at the same time, the out-of-box experience that we've just had is two commands. We go install, we go app add dot, and away we go. So let me just quickly show you the app uh, YAML. And load up Visual Studio Code. And you can see this is super, oh yeah, always get a release notes with Visual Studio Code. And it basically just gives a name and it says what the URL and path of the uh, application we're deploying is. So that's really simple. And, and this is a really interesting point. So we're giving an application a name here, but we don't really care what kind of application this is. All we're saying is there's a path, a URL, maybe a branch that we're going to pull from from Git, and it's up to you to put whatever you want there. So although, we're, although we have a concept of an application here, it's very, very, uh, it's very flexible to whatever you want to deploy. And here's the runtime YAML, sorry, the target YAML. Uh, and this is really just saying, I'm going to, it's going to reconcile every minute, and it's going to pull uh, from that uh, application called podinflow deploy from a git repository and uh, deploy it into this path into this uh, cluster so very simple automation but this is where you can go and configure and do more interesting things as well so let me just close that so I'm hoping while I've been wittering on people have all been chatting now, that pod info has been running a while. Uh, let me go back uh, to where I was and go back to kubectuttle and you can see those pods. Seven minutes, crikey, I do talk a lot, don't I? Uh, and in order to get at that, I don't have an ingress to find because that's very dependent on whether I'm in kind or GKE or EKS or whatever. So rather than that, I'm simply going to do a port forward and you can cut and paste this line here and once you do that I should be able to go to localhost 9898 and see pod info running and so there we go but so far I might as well have just kubectl applied we need to do something more interesting don't we we need to do an update to the uh, to the sorry we need to do an update to the git repo and see it change. So I'm going to start a new uh, 
Also, just want to pause a minute if, yeah. if anybody is still following along. Um, I know we've got a group of people here. Definitely don't want to go too fast. Um, I know a few people said, oh, I'll, you know, I'll watch the recording and do it later, but I do want to make sure if anybody is joining along, um, you know, noticed any challenges. Um, we don't want to be just skimming along and missing people. If anybody has notes in the chat, if you are following along or have lost interest, <laughs> all of the above are important for us. Yep. And I think this is also good because we'll okay, got a couple of comments. We'll get to a place where uh, we'll also be able to see it in action, right? See the magic. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad you gave your comments. Just making sure if anybody is absolutely stuck. Those are the things we want to learn as well. Um, whatever environment you have or um, what prerequisites maybe were challenging. Okay. Um, okay. And yes. Oh. Uh, okay. Some people have Docker machine conflicts with the network. So can't run kind. Trying it with EKS Cuddle now. Interesting. Cool. Think about yes. Thank you for that. And uh, cool. Yeah, appreciate that. We really appreciate any feedback you can offer. So I'm also interested to see how that works with EKS Cuddle. Cornelia, did you have a comment? Yeah. So since we have just a moment while you're still waiting for other folks to chime in, when um, uh, Paul was just showing you the .wego directory, and then within that there was the targets, and he showed you the, he brought up some YAML that said, look, we're applying a customization from this Git, Git source over here. That directory, so I, I talked earlier about we favor convention over configuration, but I said, you get to program your own automation. Well, you can program your own automation, especially if you know and love Flux. Tom fielded some of those questions at the beginning, right? Is that you know and love Flux, so you know image update automation, for example. Well, you can just drop that image update automation into that WeGo slash targets directory and what we do as a part of WeGo, uh, of Weave GitOps, is that we are syncing everything that's in that WeGo slash targets directory. That's all getting synced into the repository, in, into the cluster. So if you want to change the automation, you we're GitOpsing the automation itself. So you can drop a few more things into that directory, and GitOps will get it'll update your GitOps automation which is super, super, super cool. So that right there is one of the surface areas of the con con configuration when you need to go beyond the conventions. Thanks, Cornelia. Definitely, definitely good to remind. Um, so, okay, yep. So I'm gonna do an update to my, uh, in fact, I think I'm gonna, rather than do it through my command line, which is what the instructions do. I'm going to be cheeky and go to GitHub and do it um, because I think that might be really sweet. So deploy, it's my fork. And I'm going to go, you can see here's the check in where it added those .wego files. And I'm going to go to the front end and go to the deployment YAML. And I'm going to do an edit right here. And you can see that in here, there is a particular UI color for the front end, and I'm just going to replace that with 88888. And I'm going to do an update uh, color. And, uh, you know, in a true GitOps fashion, I should really create a new branch and start a pull request and then approve my pull request. Um, but I think for today, we don't have that much time left, so I'm just going to commit the changes directly. And I'm going to go back to my window here and do a kubectl pods in that test namespace. And we can see what's happening. 
So fingers crossed within about a minute this is going to start to reconcile. So do you remember that one minute setting? That's the default setting for how often it checks the, um, the updates. So and yeah, let's hope I've done this correctly. There we go. So you can see it's starting a new front-end pod uh, that it's just started. And that's going to soon be running. And then as soon as that's running, it's now going to terminate the old pod. So it's doing a rollover. And the really nice thing here, it's not touching my backend because my backend YAML didn't change. So Flux is not going to mess with that. And so it's terminating the old one. And so now that's running. So now I can go back to my port forward command, restart that, and go look at that. And look, my color has changed to gray. So I just did a change in the GitHub. It automatically reconciled and is up to date. And that is the core of GitOps. So hopefully if you were still following on, you got to that point, and you have hopefully got to this point. Congratulations, you've successfully generated GitHub, so thank yeah. you. Yeah, and um, not to put Cornelia on the spot, but uh, I was wondering maybe this would be a great place to reiterate sort of the, the magic um, and the context that you shared in the beginning to remind us, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll notice that, that the last step that Paul did is super, super important. It is the fact that once you've run those two WeGo commands, you don't have to run WeGo commands anymore. It's not that you're using the WeGo API to do your deployments or anything like that. What you did was Paul used the WeGo commands to establish the automation so that in the end, all he did was change something in the Git repository. So you've established that automation and now you can just work in the way that feels comfortable and natural to you and optimizes all of those other things that you used to, you know, it used to be that when I changed some code somewhere, I would have to go and I'd have to go change the configuration and I'd have to do a kube cuddle and all of that stuff, all that's handled for you. Um, so that, that, that last step is super important because that's your ongoing. That'll be your Amazing. next step and your next step and your next step. You won't be running WeGo anymore. Yep. Awesome. And we've had a couple of people say that you were able to get to the end with no issues. Very cool. That's good. <laughs> um, and if anybody did have issues, we are looking for that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we were Please. internally helping out uh, in the past leading up to this. and. Yeah, it's good to see people come with different machines and such and, and hit Roblox. Yeah. Um, so if anybody did hit Roblox, other than the people who already shared, uh, happy to help. We have a few minutes. Otherwise, um, we will be providing these again in the future. Obviously, our goal is to have more and more people needing to go through these steps and you know want to make sure that we're emphasizing the why to get sort of the carrot, the why you want to go through these steps. And um, maybe it's your first time even trying GitOps, or it's your first time, you know, using uh, Weave GitOps. We want to make sure that uh, we're learning from you and improving the docs and improving the experience. So we hope to bring these to you as again, again. So please tell your friends. Um, otherwise, if there aren't any questions, then I will share the closing slide to remind you of these links so you can go do these on your own. Paul, did you have anything else you wanted to share before I? No, I just want to say thank you, firstly to you, Tamo and, and Cornelia, and secondly to everyone who followed along. Um, and if Fred has challenge with EKS Cuttle, then I will hang out in the um, we GitOps uh, chat for a while and see if you need any help going on yes. beyond this. Would love to see how that goes with yeah. um, EKS Cuddle. So with that, I will take over and I will share my closing slide. Can everybody see that?
Yes. Great. Yes. So the and anybody anybody who registered here, you'll get a follow up email with these links. So most importantly, we have the main page um, for Weave GitOps Core, which is what we walked through today. Um, and then the guides um, are linked from there. So on that page, you'll have the link to um, uh, these main resources. So you'll get started, it'll link you to where to download. Um, and then most importantly, if you get stuck or need help, then um, we have this bit.ly that will get you to the Weave GitOps Slack. Um, and then I'd added a link in chat. If you haven't been on our Slack yet, then um, you invite yourself to um, slack.weave.works. So we'll be sending that as well. So yes, look forward to seeing everybody in that Slack channel. Um, follow along and tell us how it goes. And as I mentioned, we just soft launched this. So with every iteration, hopefully it'll be more and more clear of this thing that we're building um, and um, toward the various use cases that we really want to help you out with getting a GitOps set up. Uh, again, if you, um, I will go back. Um, if you didn't see GitOps days, you can go uh, register there. It was really amazing to see um, this was our second GitOps days that we did. Uh, we did an EMEA one in the fall, but really it was the kind of the, sex, the, the, the second main one that we um, put out there. And just in 13 months since May of last year, it was really amazing to see us going from uh, some kind of thought leadership companies really sharing what they've done with GitOps to now, you know, went many more enterprise companies sharing their stories, saying how it's so essential, um, you know, getting people excited about getting started with GitOps. And so um, we hope that you'll find those uh, resources useful. If you register at the event page here, you'll, you'll get all of the talks in advance um, of others. And so you'll be able to hear those great stories from companies like um, State Forum and De Deutsche Telekom, um, and then Paul, you had a GitOps maturity model talk that referenced um, several other companies that I'm blanking on. Fidelity was one of them, but, but there are a few others that you brought up that I hadn't heard before. So it's just so exciting that you know we at WeWorks are able to uh, meet with these companies and, and hear their stories and share them with you and, and see where they are on their GitOps journey. So uh, please uh, get the email that Stace will be sending out. And um, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again as you move forward with Weave GitOps. So thank you to Cornelia and uh, Paul, and thanks to everybody. We'll see you next time.